Let me restart recording. Okay, that's done. Um, and nobody else is waiting to come in. Um. <laughs> All right, not a surprise. What is not a surprise? Oh boy. <laughs> So why don't I uh, officially open up the, the planning board meeting for Thursday, June 11th at 2020. That's happening uh, through, of course, the Zoom platform rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, I don't know if there's, well, just for the record, we'll ask anybody in the audience if they'd like to make any, any uh, remarks to the planning board that are not on tonight's agenda. Tonight's agenda is fairly slim. It looks like there's nobody from the public who's in. Okay, thank you. So we all have everybody's uh, name on the lower on our screens here. I'm not sure if it's worth the time for us to go around the Zoom room and introduce ourselves. Um, we do have three oh. people from the, the Department of Public Works with us. David Valenta, who's the city engineer. Rich Parasoletti, the uh, cemeteries division. Forestry Parks and the City Tree Warden, and Doug McDonald, the Stormwater Manager in the Engineering Division. <clears throat> I really want to thank all three of you for finding the time to do this with us. Um, this is great to give us kind of a broad overview of the way the Planning Board uh, sometimes interacts, overlaps with uh, the Department of Public Works mission. Um, so, Carolyn, is there any other business that we need to address before we start with uh, Mr. Valletta? Um, no, there's not. Um, and we have some other items afterwards, but um, nothing that needs to be taken care of right now. Okay, great. And David, did I assume Carolyn briefed you a little bit on kind of um, what we were hoping to get at tonight? Um, she uh, built it as an open discussion, but I know that uh, Rich and Doug and I have been, probably spent, I don't know, three or four hours this afternoon trying to gather our thoughts and make sure that we were able to uh, try to present something to you. Um, so uh, we've been doing that somewhat independently. Um, I did prepare a few short remarks, and uh, but I think the idea is that um, to introduce people that haven't been on the board uh, for any extended period of time, what the DPW's role is in review of various various projects. Um, and then we would just open it up to questions. Um, so that was um, my approach, if that seems appropriate to you. That, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, as always, we, we appreciate your, uh, Carolyn's invitation for uh, to have key DPW members uh, come and participate in this open discussion. And uh, we obviously also very much appreciate uh, all of your volunteer service and willingness to engage in uh, with development and sustainability projects and, and issues in the city. Uh, DPW reviews all special permit, site plan and subdivision applications, basically to ensure that the proposed project plans and details are sufficiently clear and detailed to demonstrate conformance with all city policies and standards for city utilities, sidewalks, roadways, traffic, and mm -hmm. public shade and significant private trees. Uh, so I participate in and, and oversee DPW reviews and collaborate with uh, my engineering staff, the water and sewer and drain superintendents and the tree warden to compile comments in the memos that we provide to the board through Carolyn. Um, Doug is the uh, stormwater manager and he's obviously the primary reviewer for stormwater and drainage issues, uh, which can be complex. And uh, he'll be discussing that uh, a little bit more in, in terms of the stormwater permitting process. And uh, Rich Parcelletti is uh, part of, is the forest uh, parks and cemeteries superintendent, but he's also the tree warden. So in that role, he's uh, reviewing all the issues, tree related issues that come up with respect to, to projects. Um, you know, my experience, uh, I was reflecting back a little bit and realized that uh, at least uh, Carol and Doug and I have been working together on projects with the planning board for over a dozen years, um, which is a bit of a shock at this point. And, 
which has gotten more involved in the last uh, half a dozen years or so as uh, things have ramped up in the city in terms of uh, planting trees and uh, focusing uh, our efforts on, on preserving the canopy and, and replacing uh, the canopy wherever possible. Um, so over those 12 years, I've seen a lot of projects uh, come and go, and uh, they range from the, the simple to very complex. And, and I have to say every project is unique. Um, you know, it's interesting how things shift. Uh, simpler projects can be a challenge because they're often lacking informational information and or professional support. And uh, they tend to focus on the building and not necessarily the utility information, which is uh, utility or tree information, which is what we're interested in. Um, when, comp when projects get more complex, Carolyn uh, convenes a technical review with the applicant, uh, their supporting professionals and key departmental reviewers uh, throughout the city for an initial look at the plans and uh, discussion with the proposed proponent regarding any apparent major issues that should be addressed prior to submitting the application. Uh, so that can be very beneficial uh, for everybody involved so that by the time the uh, proponent actually provides uh, presentation to the planning board, the number of issues has at least been winnowed, if not completely reduced. Um, I think it's interesting because my general experience uh, is that proponents uh, not being assured of approval uh, tend to oftentimes limit the scope and detail of their permitting plans uh, because they don't want to expend uh, too much time or expense if for some reason they're not get it, gonna get approved. Um, so it's our role in a lot of ways to review the plans in, in detail and request revisions and clarifications that provide a permitting set with a clear representation of what's intended to be built. Um, at the same time, we recognize that some details and comments will only get fully addressed once permitting is complete, which is why we often request that actual construction plans be submitted to DPW for review prior to the issuance of any city construction permits and have that as a condition of planning approval. Uh, the building commissioner obviously is also instrumental in supporting these submission requirements for both construction plans and then for the stormwater permit process, uh, which can, Doug can uh, talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, that's really all I have uh, at this point. I'd be happy to respond to any questions, uh, but it might make more sense to just sort of have Doug and uh, Rich say a few words about uh, their view and their roles, and then we could just open it up to uh, questions to any one of the three of us. Great. I'll take over. Um, I'm Doug McDonald, and can you hear me? Yep. 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 Okay. Just making sure. Um, I'm the stormwater manager, and um, my job in the city is is to oversee the city's um, compliance with the EPA permit, which is a it's called the MS4 stormwater permit, um, and that has a variety of things that we need to maintain compliance with. It's it, it, we do public education. We look at we, we look for illicit discharges to the system. Um, we look at construction sites and and make sure that they're not they have erosion sediment control. We look at um, post construction standards, which is what the stormwater permit um, gets into, and 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 what the a lot of the projects that you see we're we're looking at those post construction standards, what's the system going to do afterwards. And then uh, we also have to look at good housekeeping and pollution prevention. So keeping our system <laughs> working well and upgrading it and, and over time and, and, you know, cleaning catch basins, sweeping the streets, all that kind of stuff. So, so my job is, is, is bigger than just the stormwater permit for development projects, but um, out of that EPA permit, we have a requirement to have a, a ordinance, a local ordinance that requires stormwater standards for new development and redevelopment. And um, in Northampton, it's the, the trigger for the stormwater permit is um, anything over one acre of disturbance, a stormwater permit is required. 
Um, and that a lot of times it's the same submission that, um, that you're seeing for the planning board. It's a plan set and it's drainage calculations and information for drainage. Um, and we, so I review that based on, um, they, the, the standards for that are the same um, as the state standards for wetland permitting. Um, we apply those to any project in Northampton that disturbs over one acre. Um, and so the project needs to, to meet, uh, the, the, there's three most important standards. Um, the, the stormwater system that's designed uh, has to be designed so that there's no more, the, the peak flow coming off the site um, after development is the same as before development. And that's for the, the two and 10 year des design storms, but we also look at the 100 year design storm. Um, and, and we're looking, more and more engineers are using better numbers for design storms. They're using bigger um, numbers because the storms are, as, as we know, getting, getting larger. Um, and so they are responding by designing things with those, those larger um, you know, inches per hour rates. Um, uh, that's kind of a, an evolving science. They're still trying to get to a, a standard uh, that everybody accepts. So, so luckily, a lot of the engineers are using the, the new numbers. Um, so that's for peak, peak flow. We also look at um, recharge to groundwater. So making sure that the system that is there replicates as much as possible uh, the, the water going into the ground as it did before the development. Um, and th that comes down to basically designing a volume in, in, the, in the system to hold that water and let it go in the ground. Um, and it depends on the soil type for, the, for that site. Um, you know, if it's, if it's tight soils, you're not gonna get a lot of water in the ground, but if it's sandy, uh, you, can get, you can get a higher amount of water in the ground. And, and so there's, there's different rates that are applied to that in the calculations. Um, and then the third standard we look at is water quality. Um, we the, the standard is that um, the system has to remove at least 80% of the total suspended solids in, in the stormwater. So it can be a range of, of things from rain gardens um, to proprietary systems that, that separate the sediment and, and, um, and then those systems have to be cleaned out. So um, we the, another part of the stormwater permitting um, is a, a general push for low impact development, uh, for green infrastructure, for things like rain gardens and vegetated systems that um, do a better job over time of, of cleaning out nutrients and, and, and cleaning up the stormwater. Um, a lot of times it's, it's on sites there, it's, it's hard to fit all those in, especially in the downtown area. So it's a constant sort of push to, for those kind of systems versus, um, you know, underground systems, more sort of gray infrastructure, um, which do work, but um, may not work as well, may not be as easy to maintain. Um, so part of, um, uh, part of the, the push for low in impact development and green infrastructure, um, you know, we encourage if there is any discretion with the planning board to, to push in that direction um, uh, for different sites. I, we do that up front and try to get it done, but sometimes it's, it's, it's continues to the, the meetings and discussions that you have. Um, and that sometimes we condition to, to have more of that done. Um, so then another thing that we look at is um, the long-term maintenance of the system. Uh, we require that an agreement is put in place that's recorded at the registry with a schedule in, of inspection and maintenance of the system and requiring, you know, an engineer to keep 
keep up with the system and, and that it make sure that the maintenance is being done. Um, that's a constant struggle to, to make sure that the, that is done. Um, we, it's kind of a work in progress, I would say. Um, and that's why I think we really try to push for systems that are easier to maintain, easier to see if they're failing on the surface um, without having, you know, a, an expert having to open up a structure and really determine if it's failing. It's better if it's on the surface and we can see if it's not working. Um, and um, the, another thing we're dealing with in the next year, uh, the standards uh, that the EPA is requiring us to have uh, implement for stormwater are slightly different than what DEP is requiring. So we have to reconcile those. Um, there's a, there, it's, it's a little more stringent what the EPA are requiring. They're requiring uh, for new development that um, uh, the first inch of rain is, is recharged to the ground period uh, for all um, impervious surface on the, on that, those sites. So that's, that would be a, a big change. Um, um, so that we're going to be working that into the stormwater ordinance over the next year, as well as some other changes to the ordinance to sort of bring it into compliance with that. Um, and then, um, can I ask the, a question? Is that, yeah, sure. Is that, um, by changing the rules like that, are you going to find that it's going to be hard to manage, maintain? I mean, it seems like there's a there's a value in sort of everything being the same for a long time, mm -hmm. so that you can point point to it and say, "Oh, you you have to fix that." Right. You mean the, the new standards from the EPA? The, yeah. Yeah. Um, it. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to, to add in an, a different standard and a new standard, um, but it is, it's, it's required. So okay. we have to do it. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how, how hard it is to implement that. You know, it's going to take some time for the engineers and designers and applicants to understand that they have to meet that new standard. Um, and it may, for new development, may be a harder standard to meet. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, there, there's one um, option that we may consider uh, that we, we haven't done before, which is um, allowing offsite mitigation for stormwater. Um, so it's an option we, we can do. We don't know if we want to do it uh, because it's complicated. But uh, so if a site can't fit in the the stormwater system and the treatment on that site, um, they could build it on another site. They could build it perhaps in, you know, on, on another private site or on in a city roadway if we have a project that we want to do. It would be similar to traffic mitigation um, funds that are applied, you know, in that general area. Uh, but we've got to work out some of the complexities of that and see if that's that's worth doing um, but it's going to be yeah those those are going to be changes um, that we have to make um, and then um, for small uh, projects under one acre um, we also review what comes into the planning board uh, the stormwater systems and um, for uh, the projects major projects um, we look at the same standards basically that we do for the stormwater permit as the projects get smaller it's we're not looking as much at 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 all those standards um, um, but we provide comments we we try to get um, operation and maintenance agreements in place even if it's small systems because these systems are only as good as uh, the maintenance that's done on them and keeping them functional um, so I, I think, I, think I, I covered everything I wanted to. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Doug, I have a question. Um, yep. The threshold of one acre of disturbance, what, it, does that like, include somebody building a single family house but wanting an enormous lawn 
It does. We've had a couple with long driveways. Yeah. That, that, um, that it applies to. So that's slightly different than the state standard, which exempts single family houses for the wetlands and, and stormwater standards, but um, our ordinance pulls it in. If, if they're disturbing over an acre, they, we look at it as that impact requires a permit. And disturbance doesn't just mean construction, it could mean landscaping or driveway. Or right, right, mm -hmm. and any disturbance, yeah. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, let's let's move over to Rich, and then we can <coughs> kind of start firing our questions. Thank you, George uh, and Carolyn, and thank you uh, to the other planning board members for <coughs> um, I kind of have a unique role. Uh, I have uh, I'm with the city's uh, uh, tree warden, uh, but I'm also the superintendent of the forestry park and cemetery division, so I have like, multiple roles. But well, my main function as a tree warden is to uphold uh, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 87 um, that governs uh, the uh, care and protection of uh, public, sh public shade trees in the public right of way. But uh, under our city ordinances, uh, in particular the zoning ordinance, I have this little special caveat where I actually um, get to review uh, all the plans, special permit site plans that come in front of the planning board. I work closely with Carolyn. Um, she sends me all the plans and I get to review them all. Um, I also work with David and Doug in our own department to actually provide commentary um, for um, uh, the overall package that goes back to all of you to review. Uh, however, sometimes my commentary comes directly from, from Carolyn just because I, if I, I see there's something wrong with a particular plan or a question or something, I like to have Carolyn actually work with the applicant uh, to correct it before it comes before you. Um, so basically, you know, in these plans that are submitted to you, uh, uh, I'm actually looking to understand, you know, making sure that the applicant is complying with the significant tree ordinance, uh, making sure that they have a, an inventory that is accurate of the, of the trees that are on the property um, or that are proposed to be removed in the plan and the ones that are proposed to be saved so we can make sure they're protected uh, correctly. Um, I'm also interested in um, the mitigation for the loss of the trees in these uh, particular projects uh, um, based upon either their, their monetary mitigation or the replacement to make sure they're the correct tree species and they fit within our, um, our tree list and planting guidelines, which we use to uh, rest restore or replace the city's tree canopy. Um, I'm also uh, also involved in actually making sure that the trees that they do plant uh, within these projects are actually alive and well after after you know roughly two years after the project has been completed. Um, so I mean I, I it's amazing I, I guess I I didn't you know when I became the tree warden six years ago it was uh, I I didn't realize that I was going to be giving so much information uh, that actually comes in front of you so it's been very interesting to me I've learned a lot actually. So that's, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot more to it, I think, but it's kind of, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but I guess I have a very a passion for trees. I've been in the city for 30 years. I've worked here for 31 years. And uh, I feel like this is actually where I belong after all these years. So this is actually great. And I have really great working relationship uh, with, uh, with the staff, with the uh, planning sustainability and the review staff. Thank you very much, Rich. Yeah, I, I know from my point, I think the other planning board members, it's, it's, uh, it's just a bonus to be able to meet the three of you because we often see your names on the bottom of memos and reports. And uh, so now we can really at least uh, place a name with a face when we're scratching our heads. So um, this is great. So I know that I, I have a number of questions um, and I hope others do too. Um, so why don't, Perhaps the best way to do it is to be as fair as we can. We'll kind of go around the room and just ask each person to raise one question that you may have, or if you don't have something at this point, you could just pass to one of your colleagues um, so that I don't take up the whole evening. Um, <laughs> how about if we start with uh, the sharply dressed fellow in the corner, David, are you with us? I am. 
Oh, I'm sorry, not David Valenta, but David oh. Whitehill. All right, David sorry. Whitehill. Yeah. I'm in That's the corner. Right. The other, I have a different uh, grid view than you do, so. I don't want to. I don't want to make anyone think I'm wearing a suit and quarantine. Uh, I don't. I don't have any questions right now. Thank, thanks, though, George. Okay. Thank you, Jana. Uh, nothing from me at this point, but I'm very happy to um, meet and hear from all of you, and appreciate you being here. Okay. Great. Um, how about over to Marissa? I am also listening and learning, and very grateful um, for your time tonight. Great, great. Um, Yuri? I think you have all the questions because I do not have questions now. I'm learning about it, so hey, right? Yeah, okay. Krista, anything from your perspective? No, yeah. huh? No. All right. <laughs> all right. And Sam, you had one earlier, but. <coughs> Sam, unmute yourself. Uh, it was just, do you find, is the soil, this is just a weird general question, is the soil throughout Northampton the same or is it, I mean, is it just different from like one acre to the next or one half acre to the next? I mean, is it, can you, can you look at it and be like, oh, well, you're going to have trouble or. <laughs> It can be very different, yeah. But you have to think. And the, the, there's a lot of areas in the downtown area that are underlain by um, by clay. Um, uh, eventually, you'll get to clay, so it it doesn't provide a whole lot of opportunity for water to get in the ground. And then the, the next question is: that, Are you finding that people? We've asked this question a couple of times when stormwater issues come up. Do you find that people are maintaining these these uh, systems? Some, some are, some aren't. Some, you know, <laughs> it's, it it's going to we're going to need to push a lot harder to get everybody to participate in me. And I guess what is and, the and you know, luckily, a lot of them they're not going to fail immediately. It's not going to they they work pretty well for a while. <laughs> And so if they're not maintained, what's the stick? Um, if they're failing, if they're really failing, we can go on and fix it and put a lien on the property. Okay. We also have some that, uh, some systems that have credits associated with them in mm. terms of the stormwater utility. So I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but I think that yeah. can be a stick as well, is that we can, deny, we can deny continuation of the stormwater credit until such time as they bring it into compliance. Good. Thanks. There's also, in terms of the subdivisions, the older subdivisions um, still have, um, carry those responsibilities. So subdivisions that the boards approved, you know, decades ago have an owner's association and there's a the, uh, there's a, a maintenance um, sum of money that's kept in reserve in case there's catastrophic failure. This isn't just general maintenance, this goes on sort of beyond what general maintenance would be, but um, that funding is potentially available if something has to be um, reconstructed after 25 years or what have you. <coughs> the owners Association can dip into that reserve account to rebuild, but that's separate. That's a sort of separate um, conversation or discussion or understanding um, from the regular maintenance that's required of these systems. Okay. Alan or Krista? Yeah, I got a question. Um, uh, but the trees, um, the huge number of trees that are getting planted um in the tree belt all over the city which is a wonderful thing i think that's just one of the greatest things the city has done for a long time uh, who pays for it the, the, the taxpayer so we, the, we we have we have a funding mechanism built into the dpw budget uh it's fifty fifty thousand dollars just to buy the plant material 
uh, and all the labor uh, that's associated with the plantings uh, is virtually uh, all from Tree Northampton, which is uh, our 501c3 partners that uh, myself and the Public Shade Tree Commission are partnered with to make all these plantings possible. And who waters, who fills the bags to water them? So I have, uh, uh, we have uh, one full-time employee that works with me uh, to actually water. Right now she's watering actually about the 400 trees we planted last year. Uh, and then uh, we supplement that with the seasonal staff. Uh, so typically we have two people watering. Last year when it was hot, we had over 700 water bags out. We were watering trees that were planted three years ago. Hmm. Wow. And just out of curiosity, how once the bag is filled, how long does does it last? Probably about it depends, probably six hours. Um, oh, it goes it, quick. Yeah, it it's, uh, goes quickly. Um, they're very small holes, but it'll be empty by the next day. So six to eight hours. Um, they hold 20 gallons. So you typically want to, uh, in this kind of weather we've had, they have to have at least a minimum of 20 gallons uh, a week. Uh, we don't really have enough staff at the moment to actually water everything twice a week. It's pretty, pretty impossible. Um, typically after three years of a tree being planted and becoming established, uh, it should be able to survive without having supplemental water. But of course, as you probably all recognize, our summers are much hotter and much drier than we are accustomed to. So um, that three year time frame actually may not apply. Um, every, uh, in every season. Uh, I have and Rich, question. those, um, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's not, uh, it's not personal at all. Uh, mm -hmm. and at all related to the two trees on my tree belt in front of my house. <laughs> uh, but those, they have tags on there that say, uh, to, um, to asking the homeowners to do that. Yep. So I've got two questions. One, is it possible to overwater these trees? Um, and two, are you finding that um, homeowners are helpful with that, or? So, so the tags that are on the so the tags that are on the trees. We last year we put a bunch of tags on the trees because we were struggling to actually get 700 trees watered, and we asked uh, as many residents um, as possible that we could actually communicate with to, to take some time and water the trees if they could. Um, and your your question about overwatering trees, yes, it is. It can be detrimental to them. Um, typically, the problem with the water bags is that the water bags actually, if you overwater the tree, the water bags, it's, it's a very damp and moist area underneath the water bag. So the bark actually starts to get very moist, um, a place where pathogens can get in, where insects can get in. A lot of communities actually stake their trees and they put the water bags on uh, stake instead of the water bag on the trunk. Uh, that does a couple of things. It helps the tree actually to um, basically it forces the roots to actually seek out the wet soil, so it forces the roots to grow, and then it prevents the trunk from getting um, those things I just talked about, which is, uh, you know, potential decay entry points and insects. Unfortunately, it requires uh, a lot more uh, personnel power to water all the extra bags. So we are unfortunately just using one bag per tree. And that's why I typically only go once a week, and then I'll obviously we watch the rainfall amount. But we haven't had much rain since really since April of this year. So uh, I have a question here, just on that with planting trees. You guys work with nonprofit organizations yes. Yes. because I have on my my street and adjacent streets there is this nonprofit. They are coming and planting and doing the whole thing. Where uh, where where is it? What's your street? What street do you live on? Oh, so the trees, you, the city buy it or is yes. they? Yes, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yes, the city buy it. So we enter into a contract with a, a, a nursery. We purchase the trees. Uh, here at the cemetery in the back, we have a holding pen where we, I, right now there's uh, about 200 trees down there that we were anticipating to plant this spring. But we, well, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to plant anything um, because of social distancing issues. So we're hopeful to plant all those trees this fall. Um, and uh, we, so we will take care of them over the summer. They're above ground. And then we actually identify the locations in the public right away where we like to plant the trees. We stake them and we have to go through a permit process, an internal uh, trench permit process. 
and then um, the day of the day before the plantings, we'll bring the trees out there, and the volunteers come out the day uh, the day after, and they plant with us. All right. So I want to move away from trees just for a minute. Um, I, I, and maybe this question is for David, and certainly um, Doug and Rich chime in if you want. But through my experience with the planning board, we often rely on. Uh, Northampton sustainability plan and that vision 2020 that took place quite a while ago. Um, and now we're looking at a new plan around uh, resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, and I think applicants, especially for special permits, have to reference our sustainability plan. Does the DPW in itself have a long term, any kind of uh, planning manifesto, so to speak, that talks about kind of the capacity of our water systems or sewage systems, things of that nature that would be helpful for the planning board to be aware of? Starting in about uh, 2012, um, the director and city engineer at the time started looking at long-term planning. And so at this point we have uh, detailed um, analysis and uh, planning understanding for separate utilities. So there was a stormwater plan that was completed or stormwater analysis and plan that was completed by uh, CDM Smith in uh, 2012, I believe. Doug, is that right? That's right. Um, and then Tata and Howard uh, did a, uh, um, a water asset management plan for the uh, water supply. Uh, infrastructure uh, in 2013 and then in 2015 um, Kleinfelder completed a comprehensive wastewater management plan uh, which is the basis is forming the the basis for work that were started doing down at the wastewater treatment plant uh, a couple of years ago and we just uh, awarded a 10 million dollar contract in the process of awarding a 10 million dollar contract to uh, R.H. White for uh, phase one of, uh, of upgrades that uh, are planned over the next 20 years at the plant and at pump stations uh, for, I can't remember exactly the figure, but we're looking at uh, 50, 60 million dollars uh, at least over a 20 year period. Um, those plans do not necessarily take sustainability into account. I mean, we're dealing with hard infrastructure here for the most part that is necessary in order to um, maintain and provide the, the, um, the utility infrastructure services that the city is used to receiving and uh, would want to continue to receive in the future. Um, we recognize, however, that Sustainability is is very important, and we certainly collaborate with uh, with other um, other departments to do what we can at our various industrial facilities to make them more sustainable and more efficient. We've worked a lot with uh, with Central Services and Chris Mason. There have been uh, upgrades uh, for lighting and various other. Um, <laughs> other things uh, at, at various facilities throughout the, the DPW. Uh, I will say that the, the current project for the wastewater treatment plant does take um, energy efficiency very seriously. Uh, nonetheless, it is still an industrial plant and requires a lot to, uh, to, to actually operate. Um, so does that sort of address your <clears throat> question there, George? Yeah, kind of. You know, I was fortunate to be on the planning board about 15 years ago when there was a lot of many more subdivision permits. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn was there too in the outer reaches of Ward 6. And I think at that time there was a little almost hesitancy for some of because we thought we were extending the water and sewer and fire protection, a number of things a little bit too too far, far than we could manage. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think anything was restricted at that point, and certainly that's where some of the advocacy for infill came in. If we kept some of the development within the center of town, more or less, um, part of our utility extension or um, overcapacity might not be affected. So. Um, 
Well, it's an interesting uh, question. I think, you know, a, a certain number of the outlying developments are private wells and septic systems uh, as, as well. Um, you know, the water system certainly extends further out than the sewer system does. But I, I will take this opportunity to say that the, the infill um, developments have definitely been a challenge for DPW in terms of the, ex the the capacity and condition of the older infrastructure downtown. I mean, we're trying to squeeze a lot more into a smaller space and, and that has created challenges on our end in terms of what we have existing and what we can and can't demand of developers in order to be able to accommodate that, that additional infill development. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and I have a quick question. I think that Doug made some good remarks about some of the stormwater retention plans, and especially downtown, where there isn't room on the site for rain gardens or um, other kinds of retention ponds. So more and more designs are going underground, which uh, to me always seem to be kind of a <laughs> ticking time bomb once they're paved over and you know, other infrastructure happens on top of it. So um, it would be good to know from you folks if we can support you at the planning board during our hearings on kind of pushing back gently on some of those or, or I don't know, getting more information from other areas that in fact these underground storage systems um, aren't as vulnerable as a rookie like I might think. Um, so any thoughts on those, Doug? Yeah, I, are seeing. I think you're right. Every it's always harder to 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 fix something underground if it if it does get messed up. Uh, but it's a, a lot of that is you know those systems can be well de designed. Um, it it all comes down to keeping pollutants out, keeping things out of those systems that might compromise them, and keeping those systems maintained. Um, and that, that gets back to the maintenance piece of right. it that, that, you know, I think we, there's some that have pretty large systems. And if those systems were to fail, they would start to stress, possibly add too much water to our, our drainage system in the roadways near there. So it's, it's we need to keep an eye on those and, and push harder and make sure. And, and you know, I think, in some cases, people are doing maintenance. We're just not hearing about it. Um, but we're, we're going to work harder in the near future to to get you know more information and 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 educate owners about the maintenance. Also, they may not even be aware of it. Um, um, yeah. But it's it's hard to it, especially infill and downtown. It's just the space is always difficult. There's not as much. So 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 things are going to go underground. Um, there's no way to stop it. I don't think I, you know, I appreciate your uh, willingness to push back, but it's just, if they're meeting the technical standard um, and it's acceptable, you know, design, um, we usually approve it, but then it comes into, in the long run, how does it, how does it get maintained? How does it get, you know, do they keep going? Uh, um, I see Carolyn and Krista. You can go ahead, Krista, if you'd like. Oh, my question is, how do they maintain these systems? I don't know that I, I don't know that I'm aware of what is, what does that look like? Is it like a pumping system or? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see a back truck come out and, and suck out the, the, so there's sort of swirl chambers. Sometimes they'll open a manhole cover, put it, Put a hose down and, and and pretty much back out any any of the debris and sediment in those systems. Okay. And then there's they can open up observation ports and look down and see is it holding water? Is there sediment down there? And they can also clean those systems out. Um, Great. They there, there's a lot of different ways to come at it. It's it, they are underground, but they I try to push for access. Um, you know, manhole access ports that they can 
get at least they can see what's going on. They can get the equipment down there after the fact and clean it out. Thank you. Yeah. But in some ways, Doug, I mean, those are those are private systems. And I'm just realizing in some ways it's sort of a parallel to a septic system. If you have a leach right. field that fails, um, then it becomes apparent and you basically have to dig it up and replace it. So I would imagine that there's probably a design life to some of these underground systems. We don't really know what those are yet because they haven't been in the ground long enough. But my suspicion is that at some point they will begin to fail and the remedy will be that they have to replace it in kind or with whatever the current improved technology is, which uh, shouldn't be any less effective and hopefully would be more effective by the time they have to do that. But that would be that would be a private developer's burden because they assumed the risk of putting that kind of a system in in the first place. And I was just going to add to that, what, um, George, or I can't remember who may have said this, but one of the benefits of having an underground system is you you know we're talking about the difference between building. Um, or redeveloping sites that have already been built out. And there may not be room, especially in town, for creating these vast grassy areas that will just be acres of detention ponds and we need to um, accommodate and actually encourage different types of stormwater management that is not so land um, intensive in its, in its use. Um, and, sort of related to that, Doug, you mentioned the um, the first inch rainstorms that are um, that EPA is going to be requiring the city to ensure that um, that water that amount of water is recharged. That I think will have ramifications about how we deal with infill and what do we do with spaces like downtown where there isn't recharge capacity. Um, or other places where the soils just don't accommodate that. Um, so I think that's gonna have an effect on, you know, the planning board's role in terms of what, how we permit projects, what we're trying to encourage. I mean, does this mean that EPA is pushing for more suburbanization so that we can, you know, deal with this new stormwater or is it really gonna be only how we should treat more suburban areas versus urban areas. And can we, do we have that capacity to yeah, differentiate should, between that? I should add that it's uh, so the requirement is is to to treat to recharge that one acre, and, and the language is and or treat it at a higher level than so it could be a water quality treatment okay. if they can't recharge. So there's some flex. They've added some flexibility into there. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I do a lot of work in New York City where, you know, it's combined water sewer and, and you know, if you can imagine infill development problems, uh, you know, it's, everything is over capacity there. And they have pretty restrictive um, flow rates that you're allowed. <clears throat> so one thing that's come up in recent years is there is these blue roof systems. Um, which I've, I've done a couple of them um, and they have some other issues, but you know, basically developers will do anything they can to not have to dig an underground thing and, and bear the risk of that. Is that something, I don't even know if that's code compliant here or, uh, or not, or if that's something you guys have looked at the implications of. I don't know about codes. It's, we haven't seen it happen yet. We, I've, I've heard about it in mm -hmm. New York and other places, but, um, Okay. It's mostly along the lines of getting water out of the, the combined sewer drain system, which luckily we don't have that problem. Um, so a lot of times you're retrofitting an existing building with that kind of system. We don't have, we generally don't have that, we don't require an existing building to, to add something like that. So we haven't seen mm -hmm. those. But there, there, I, I, there's some interesting systems out there. You know, just even a couple inches of water on the roof can provide a lot of storage. Right. Yeah, it doesn't do anything for your recharge, I guess, but it, it does. Uh, well, it slows it down. It's all in the timing. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've noticed 
um, going on in New York that I don't know if uh, is, is a sort of a gaming the system kind of thing because of the expense of some of these systems. Um, it's become really commonplace for civil engineers to, to do what they call like a stormwater master plan where they really like deal with every detail of everything that the DEP there wants to see. Uh, but then but it always happens to be that the, the current project only takes on the first half of this master plan, which is not very much in terms of stormwater. And that's become a sort of accepted way to game the system in New York, um, unfortunately. And is I don't know, if, I doubt that that is happening in Northampton, but is there anything like that that we should just be, have our antenna out for in terms of ways that the process can be used to, you know, people can get away with things that are not, you know, in the spirit of the law? Yeah, in terms in terms of stormwater, no, I haven't haven't seen that because we we generally require a project to deal with the meet their standards on their on their site and as part of their project. Um, you know, something like Village Hill that's been in different stages and different phases. It's they they also have met each standard along the way, so it hasn't. Nothing's left. That I'm aware of, has been left undone. So. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. Okay, great. I, I will say that I, I think Doug is extremely diligent in his review of the submissions and that uh, if there are questions about how things are calculated and uh, what values are being used, he's very quick to push back on the consultant and ask the questions. So uh, whether it's inadvertent or they're trying to slip something by, they don't get by Doug. I try. <laughs> uh, that's that's good for us to hear. I'm not sure how yeah. the applicants feel about it, but it's great for us to hear. They, they manage to work with it. I think it provides a certain <laughs> measure of frustration for Doug at times. But uh. yeah, yeah. Um, if I could just switch to uh, streets for a minute, um, I know the city's done quite a lot over the past three to five years around the smart streets with uh, with DOT. Um, trying to provide more access for pedestrians and bicyclists to share a city street. Um, I know that I think the DPW has kind of a three, four, five year plan of what streets are being redone. Um, so I just wanted to hear about your take on um, the smart streets kind of uh, layout and the future of that. Given COVID, I know there's not going to be a lot of money, extra money out there for innovative things. Unfortunately, we've got to put an asterisk next to everything. Um, but, uh, and, and I don't know what that means that your chapter 90 funds, which really you depend upon for streets, but um, what is your, the, the current thinking of the DPW around new streets or improving streets and sidewalks? Well, there's, there's a number of things, as you know, we have, uh, we have, quite a bit of inventory and backlog to try to work with here. Um, the complete streets, which I think is what you're referring to, that's accommodating to all modes of transportation, um, pedestrians, bicyclists, um, and as well as vehicular traffic. Is that what you're referring to, George? Right, is right, complete right. streets? Yeah, okay. So we have a couple of engineers, including myself, uh, have taken uh, some trainings with Maps DOT uh, regarding complete streets over the years, and we've been able to uh, to leverage that through the planning department uh, into some some grant money uh, as well. I think Carolyn, I think yeah. there was yes. Um, so um, that's been uh, beneficial, and we've supported planning uh, in that objective. Um, there are some planning objectives as well that um, request the DPW in its uh, street and paving projects uh, look at the opportunities for um, improving that sort of access and providing more of a complete streets uh, view. Um, that creates a bit of a challenge for us because we have on the one hand uh, a lot of demand for improvement of the roadways themselves um, and also the sidewalks. So we're caught a little bit um, in a crossfire between trying to get something accomplished and trying to get a project completely designed so that we can actually get it accomplished. Uh, in other words, we can put together 
a roadway paving project uh, that usually involves some drainage uh, improvements as well. Uh, but if we start to add on sidewalks and uh, a full complete streets component to that, then the project uh, balloons to be much larger and uh, requires more funding. And then we limit the amount of pavement that we can actually repave in a given year. Uh, so we've we keep all that in mind and try to do incremental improvements when we repave streets. But the focus over the last few years has been really to try to address some of the backlog and the worst streets. So we've done, I think, quite a very good job um, over the past few years. Um, you know, if you try to drive around Northampton in the summer, you just uh, run into police details and uh, um, uh, road construction. So. Um, we are um, going ahead with one project this year, uh, which is funded, which is uh, North Maple Street and North Farms Road all the way to the Williamsburg town line. Uh, we do have another project that's already designed, but it doesn't look as though we're going to have the uh, funding to be able to do that uh, this year. Uh, I surprisingly did get an email, and I don't know the outcome of the uh, state Senate vote, but apparently uh, the state was looking at increasing Chapter 90 money this year by $100 million. Uh, so if that actually comes to pass, uh, that'll be, uh, be really good news for us in terms of trying to get something, something more accomplished this year. Um, I will say that uh, despite all that, any mass DOT project is required to address all the complete streets uh, components. And we have a number of those that are uh, about to begin uh, in the city in the, in the near term here, uh, which is the, obviously the roundabout uh, at the base of the Coolidge Bridge that's underway now. And the uh, Damon Road reconstruction is about to be um, uh, I don't has been awarded, uh, but it hasn't been uh, actually construction hasn't been scheduled to start on that yet. And then we have a King Street uh, corridor project from Bright Street up to Church Street that is a mass DOT uh, project uh, that the city hired the designers for. And that um, is going to be going out to bid in the next month or so. So um, we have a lot of, of good work that's happening uh, in regard to that. And then planning has been working additionally. Wayne has a project out right now through the community development block grant to uh, improve some of the handicapped access ramps at uh, some critical locations in the city. And David, do. don't forget about the biggest... Um, am I missing um, something? What am I missing? <laughs> The biggest life-changing um, plan that's underway now for Main Street. Oh, yeah. Did you want to say something <laughs> about that? <laughs> what was that? What's it up to now? $14 million or something? I think that's the general estimate at yeah. this point. So, so um, that's, <clears throat> you know, I think the, um, the board, I think we updated the board a little bit on the start of that big Main Street um, project. So that's, you know, a two year, at least a two year design project that we're underway. And we obviously got delayed with COVID for um, potentially doing some um, um, test uh, pilot um, project um, sampling in the street of determining what, you know, what kind of elements of complete streets might make sense for Main Street. But we're still planning to do that in the fall. Um, but, and, and added to your list, I mean, DPW did, went out and um, had a whole inventory of the sidewalks in the city completed, which helps to yes. um, support um, funding or, or project planning for upgrades to those side, to sidewalks, which I think also helps in terms of planning board project reviews when projects come forward and we know it's on, mm -hmm. in an area where sidewalks have been identified as, as needing um, replacement or improvement, that's a good um, piece of data to um, bring forward during that project review time. So um, that's Great. been helpful. Great. Well, thanks for that update. Pretty promising. Let's hope that money keeps coming through. Um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from board members, observations? Okie doke. Well, I have one, George. Okay. 
Um, Go ahead, Deb. Th this is a sort of broad question, and we've, we've talked about a couple of ways where this can happen, but you know, I'm aware of being a, a, a non-specialist, and you know, the work that you all do is highly technical, so that when we're getting, uh, we're reviewing plans and we're hearing your comments, my basic sense is, well, you all know what you're doing, and so you should just do whatever DPW told you that you were supposed to do, um, which I want to keep doing, but I've heard a couple of ways tonight that you've talked about some ways that we might be able to, you know, engage with or support your work a little bit more. One might be in, you know, uh, pushing a little bit for these, um, you know, more green infrastructure around stormwater systems, um, and the sidewalk improvements that Carolyn was just talking about. Are there any other ways that, that you see our, our board's role, uh, again, that we can kind of be in, engaging or supporting your work uh, more directly other than just also kind of endorsing the importance of fulfilling the, uh, the goals and the standards that you've set out? How's your chance? <laughs> Rich, uh, Rich, I know you yeah, have some you know, ideas. I, you know, I have a lot to. I have always have a lot to say. I guess, you know, being a uh, being a tree warden and uh, also being a certified arborist and having my own personal feeling opinions about large mature public shade trees, and I think how we can do a better job um, as a community as a whole to try to protect them um, in some of these projects that come in front of you. Um, I, Dewey Court is kind of one of them that has uh, been obviously has, was a little contentious there for a period of time that I believe it's going to be coming back in front of you. Um, but I mean, some of the, you know, listening to Doug talk about stormwater and one of the big pieces of, uh, of these large mature trees is that they really are, they take up a tremendous amount, thousands and thousands of gallons of stormwater. Um, they also, you know, provide a lot of carbon sequestration, a lot of cooling, um, screening, so, you know, it's, it, you, you obviously we have to weigh all of these factors uh, when you're deciding uh, to approve a project, but it, it would be, for me, it would be, sometimes I like to get way in front of the developer before they even put ink to, uh, ink to paper in these projects and encourage them to try to look at the site that they want to develop and actually try to preserve the mature trees that are there to the best of their ability um, and still make their project successful, but try to preserve some of those large uh, trees that we have in the city that unfortunately seem to get removed. Um, we are fortunate enough to have the significant tree ordinance. However, um, you know, I, I think as time goes on, we've, we've all realized that, you know, the significant tree ordinance needs to have tweaks uh, and we need to continue to review it because every time a project comes in front of you, um, you know, there's something a little different about the project a little contentious. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize the fact that in the short term, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to plant, you know, 200 to 300. Last year we did 400 trees a year. However, those 400 trees I planted really are not going to actually sequester any carbon really in our, in our lifetimes, probably. Um, it would be more for our children's lifetimes and our grandchildren's lifetimes. So the large mature trees that are um, all over the city that are held in private hands, um, which typically I have no um, say in what happens to them, um, but you do when these projects come up, I think it's important to look at them from that perspective that they provide a lot of benefits to all the residents, not just the individual uh, landowner or applicant or developer, and just kind of think a little more broadly about how important it is to try to save some of these trees. Um, or try to just ask the developer to say, look, you know, is there a way that you can preserve these trees and come back with a, a plan that's a little bit different uh, than you presently have? You know, can you, can you reduce the amount of parking that's required? Do you need all these units in this, uh, um, in this development, so on and so forth. So, but again, I mean, this is all, you know, we are in an ever-changing world and, uh, you know, but I, I think we're, we're on the right path. Um, but I think everything, you know, has to be reviewed and, and has to be tweaked as we as we go forward. Rick Fritz. I have a question. Uh, I asked this before, but Doug, you're here, so I'll ask it again. My kid is really into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and he wants to and he wants to see the sewer. 
that's, a, that's awesome. <laughs> can you can you make this happen? Uh, well, I, I I I I can't. I can make it happen with uh, probably uh, with the uh, my counterpart Mike Antosh, who is uh, okay. uh, highway superintendent responsible for the sewer drain division. Uh, you also eventually, if we ever, uh, they used to actually give tours of the different yeah. facilities. So he, that he's four works. though. He's he's four. He's four years old. Four. So. so we really need to keep this kind of simple. Yeah. yeah. Let me. I, I will do some. Uh, I will do some and get back to you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if if anything else came out of this meeting, I made a four year old happy. That's that's yeah, great. There it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a future uh, a licensed um, wastewater treatment plant operator. <laughs> Jenna, that was a good question. Th thank you very much for raising that. Um, Doug and David, I don't know if there's anything else besides kind of those mature tree. And, and we do have quite a bit of push and pull. All of the members, the planning board members can think of a couple of permits just recently where we went back and forth with the applicant around saving the tree and moving his house. And, yeah. and, it, it, and we didn't always come out on the positive side, but beyond that, are there other areas that we can help you? Uh... Good, we're doing I can't a great think job. of anything offhand. Can yeah, you do every, every project's kind of different. So it's hard to name something like that, but I, I think you touched on the, you know, for stormwater, it's the, the 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 harder approach is to have lots of little um, things like rain gardens on a site. A, a lot of developers don't want to try to do that because it's hard to do. They think, um, but I think in the long run, it's those systems can work better um, and they're easier to maintain. But it's it's one of those. You know, how do you make someone do that? Um, um, and, and I think as the, the, the regulations change, it may require more things like that in the standards. Um, but, um, I think Rich, Rich's point about trees is same, you know, as they, they contribute a lot to the stormwater, suck a lot of water in, um, the more trees we can keep, the, the better for the stormwater system. Um, and that's, you know, it's, that's a hard thing to, to always accomplish, but it's, it, and, and it, a lot of those decisions get made at the beginning of a project. Uh, so it's, you know, is it education? Maybe it's, 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 you know, teaching people more about how to develop sites um, in different ways. I think it's also important to understand that um, there are different, you know, different parts of the city may be may need to be treated differently. We did a study showing that the per capita impervious surface is three times higher in the Ryan Road area, leads that area than it is in town. So we also have to look at that picture, like how much infrastructure, how much impervious area is there, and how do we offset that with tree protection measures or other mechanisms so that we are balancing the need, you know, sort of comprehensively the issues of sustainability, making sure we're providing enough housing in the right places and, and um, sort of backfilling what we need in terms of ecological resources, where we need to do that to support development in existing neighborhoods, for sure. Okie doke. Um, if there are no other questions, perhaps we'll let the DPW reps um, move on to their regular lives and we'll finish up our small duties. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this has All been right. great. Thank, thank you, you very much you. for, thank having, you for us. having us. Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank right. you. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Good old. All right.
Uh, well, that was good. Yeah, as I said, just to kind of meet all of those and now be able to put a face to a name is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, Carolyn, you spend a lot of time with them. And I think... Uh, 12 years, I guess, at least. <laughs> I think a little more than that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to have those professionals, you know, to kind of back up our work. Other towns, um, you know, don't... I think have that same kind of quality that we do. So it makes our planning board kind of reviews that much better and easier, yeah. All right, so we have a couple other things um, on our agenda before we say sayonara. Um, there's a vote to authorize planning staff to call a letter of credit for the Northview subdivision. Carolyn, you wanna give us a little more background on that? I will. Um, so, um, this is, uh, has a lot to do with stormwater management, actually. Um, and your role in, um, I'm just going to give sort of background information. I know some of you weren't on the planning board when this subdivision was approved, but at Northview subdivision is, um, one of the last building projects up at the state hospital. And it's, um, a small loop road, um, off of, um, Usanti Drive at the end there, nor on the northern end. Um, and as with every subdivision, um, including all the subdivisions that um, were approved at the State Hospital, um, the planning board requirements or the subdivision regulations require that there be a, a financial uh, performance guarantee so that the infrastructure that's proposed and designed is completed in accordance with the design and and um, that as the project move fo moves forward that there's always this collateral um, that can be um, that's in reserve in case um, something happens with subdivision um, there are some instances and then as the project moves on the uh, developer typically comes back and asks for reduction in that letter of credit and we evaluate the what's left on the infrastructure um, portion of that and determine whether it makes sense to, um, um, to reduce that number. I'm just gonna pause here. David, did you have a question? You're on mute if you did. No, I don't have a question. Okay, you're I had a question like, yeah, that was from 20 minutes ago. Oh I, my gosh, and you didn't get- no, I asked okay. the question. You did. Yeah. Okay. Am I, I'm gonna, am I supposed I'm to put it down? I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I, yeah. I just lowered your hand, and I'm sorry I didn't notice that before. So. No, it's fine. I didn't. Okay. It was fine. I thought you noticed it. So, um, so anyway, um, as projects get closer and closer to completion, the um, developer asks to, um, to get the, those monies reduced as they finish out the project, but there's always a sum that's um, remains until absolutely everything is completed, just in case um, something catastrophic happens, the developer decides that he or she is finished and wants to move on and um, doesn't feel like taking care of anything. And um, so in this case with Northview subdivision, um, we've had some problems with the stormwater um, system. Um, there have been, um, the, the develop, the project is not complete. There are five lots left to be sold. Two of them are under covenant, um, which is part of the performance guarantee, which means the developer can't build or, or sell them until, um, they've shown that they've completed construction. There's also an additional tri-party agreement with the, with Florence Bank. So Florence Bank is holding about 200 thousand dollars in reserves so we have two hundred thousand dollars plus two lots um, as performance um, guarantee that the project will be complete um, there have been some um, failures of the infiltration basin at the top of the hill um, because the site is not stable and so sediments continue to fill up this temporary basin and then overflow because the basin is full and it can't infiltrate. Um, we've been working with the applicant for over a year to try to um, 
stay on top of each rainstorm and make sure that these things get done. We think the original infiltration basin is probably not, um, probably needs to be replaced, dug up and replaced because of the constant um, sedimentation that's been flowing into the system. Um, we've been trying to get this done since February. Um, and more recently, sort of fast forward to the last month or so, there have been some other indications that the applicant has been non-responsive to us. Um, so we are concerned that um, with five lots left and very little left of the subdivision that, you know, there, we've come to a standstill on getting these um, um, infrastructure elements completed. So um, we think it's um, prudent to um, relay the information to the developer that we will call the letter of credit, which of course the developer doesn't want because it's gonna ruin his credit potentially with the banks. Um, many times that's enough of an incentive to get the developer to go ahead and take care of the problem, finish out the project, and um, get everything squared away. So we're hoping that that will um, help in this situation, but we feel like it's gotten to a point where it needs to be escalated a little bit um, because now there are homeowners living um, in the subdivision. They are dealing with this um, flash flooding because the system is not working, it's filled with sediment. So um, what I'm asking you tonight is just to authorize the staff to go to the bank if we need to. I'm not suggesting that we are going to draw down the money. And so what happens is we can go to the bank and say, we want to call this letter, we want to, that's the term, we want to call the letter of credit. Um, but we can't spend that money to make those repairs until city council authorizes us to use that money. So your vote tonight is really just to say, okay, we're gonna hand it over to administrative staff to um, essentially get the ball rolling. Um, so that's my request for tonight. Motion to approve. <laughs> Is there a second for the motion to approve? I second if I'm allowed to. I don't know if I am with subdivisions. Oh, yeah. Not. Nah. Right. Thank you okay. for remembering that. Thanks, Jen. I'll second it. <clears throat> okay, Krista. Who is that, Krista? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, <clears throat> just a uh, quick discussion. Carolyn, is there anything in our recent kind of work, your work, where we've done that with a developer and approved effective? Um. So not since I've been with the city. Um, before my time, um, there have been a couple of occasions where we've either actually, it's spurred, uh, the bank has taken action and, and, and been able to get their client to perform the work. Yep. In other instances, the city has actually had to take the money, hold it, then hire, you know, the engineer and the, and the, um, contractors to go out and finish it. Um, and the, the only relate, and then the only other situation that's happened since for a subdivision that the board has approved since I've been with the city was for Ridgeview, in which case actually wasn't anything involved with us. We got close to needing to put pressure um, at the Ridge, uh, Ridgeview Road, which is way out on West Hampton Road, almost to West Hampton. Um, in that instance, the bank actually took over the project and they completed the project. So we didn't really, we didn't have to do anything, but we were sort of getting to that point. Carolyn, just know? kind of a detail. Um, th this, uh, I assume would also deal with the road, which as you know, is not completed. Right, so that's one of the items that's not done. So what, what happens is if we have to, Pull, if we have to draw the money from the bank, then we take all of it and it's set aside to complete everything. So to redo the stormwater uh, to the extent that it needs it or finish it anyway, because it's been temporary, there's been a temporary system at the top of the hill. Pave, 
put the trees in, you know, do all the final um, aspects of the subdivision that haven't been completed yet. Great. Any other questions before we move to the vote? Is this, is this gonna, like with COVID, is this, or I mean, and maybe this isn't our, our role, but is this gonna cause, like if we, if you draw on this, is it going to, are they gonna say, well, we just haven't had the time because, you know, COVID has gotten in the way? Not in this situation, I don't think. Okay, okay. all right. All right. Great. So, you know, when, when we have these Zoom meetings, we need to take a roll call and I'll go through the list and we'll say yay or nay um, when I call your name. So, um, the motion was made to uh, authorize the, the, the Office of Planning and Sustainability to call the, uh, to initiate drawdown funds as needed. Cool. So, uh, Jenna, uh, no, I'm sorry. You're, I think you're in limbo. Okay. Krista? Uh, yes. You're in limbo. Yuri? Huh? How do you vote, Yuri? Yes or no? Oh, <laughs> yes. No, I'm not limbo. I just did not agree with that one. <laughs> uh, Marissa? Yes. David? Um, I don't think I don't think I vote on this. Do I? Yeah, you're um, an associate as well. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Sam. Yes. Alan. Yes. All right. And George. Yes. Okie doke. I didn't miss anybody on that. No. Okay. So the motion uh, approved to authorize the planning office to move forward with that as needed. Um, or to bring it to city council as you did also. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see, next item. We had some minutes from our last Zoom meeting, the minutes of May 14th. Everybody oh. was there except Krista. I approve them. Approve them. Wait, was I not there? Krista, does it matter? I approve them. <laughs> I don't know, Sam, if it matters. But if that was the one with Karen Lavidier, I was there. Carolyn, was that the Karen Lavidier project on Jackson? Yeah, it, it was after that. Well, um, this was this was, was the one that? in Florence Street, the couple building a house behind their house the, the one for their son. Trees. Right. Yes, I wasn't there. Yeah. Sorry, we I'm missed out. you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we we know we noted it. <laughs> Who okay. so was that, Sam? Second. Yes. And Marissa. Second. Marissa yeah. seconded. Mm -hmm. This was an interesting one too, and and Carolyn noted that in the minutes, right when we came to vote on the project, unfortunately, Alan's internet went out, so he wasn't available to vote at that time. <laughs> But fortunately, there was enough of a majority one way to carry it. But that's one of the dilemmas of this Zoom system and our internet connectivity. I have uh, a thanks. bit of a conspiracy theory about that, but we won't go. <laughs> All right. All right. So the motion has been made and uh, seconded to approve the minutes of May 14th. So we'll go through the list again. Uh, we'll start with Jenna. Yes. Yes. Krista? Well, I'll pass. I wasn't there. Okay. All right. Yuri? Yes. Marissa? Yes. David? Yes. Yeah. Alan? Yes. Sam? Yes. All right. And George? Yes. So the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, last item is an ANR, our favorite ANRs on uh, Federal Street. Okay, so um, there's a house on the corner. Can you, everybody see the screen? Yeah. Okay. There's a there's a house on the corner of Federal and Warner, 170 Federal. It's a large lot. The um, buyer would like to create these two lots off the back. They've removed a garage that's off of the existing driveway here. So they're 250 by 100 foot lots, I think. Mm -hmm um approximately 
Um, and they'll have to relocate this driveway because right now the way it's showing is a shared driveway, but there's a note on the plan indicating that because otherwise it, they don't have access until they have um, access from the street. So anyway, that's going to be taken care of. So it's just for these, these two new lots um, on the corner there. Okay. <clears throat> Quick question for Carolyn. Motion to be made. Motion to approve. Yuri, thank you. Second. Second, was that Marissa? No, it was Jana. Jana. Okay. All right, any discussion? Nope, very good. Um, so we'll go through our roll call again. Ooh la la. Jana. Yes. Krista. Yuri. Yes. And Marissa. Yes. And David. Yes. Yes. Alan. Yes. Sam. <laughs> Sam and company. Yay or no? Give us a thumbs up, buddy, or thumbs down. Yeah, I'm mute. Do your kids <laughs> listen to you guys? Yeah, I, I will. Yeah. Go. Go. Okay. Give it up. go. <laughs> And George votes yes, so it's unanimously approved. Thank you very so, much. So, Carolyn, I have a question. It's, it's definitely 100% for sure that we have to go through this roll call. I mean, uh, can we just authorize something for the rest of the year? <laughs> Avoid um, roll call? No, it's because um, not everybody is visual, can see. Um, the board members, if they're calling in, um, I think that takes um, it, it just makes it much clearer who's saying yes and who's saying no. And especially with the time, you know, in Zoom, there's a little bit of a time lag. So someone might say something and it's not clear who said it. So it's important that it's on the record. And if we just raise our hands, that can be a little dicey too, I guess. Yeah, we can practice. We can practice. Well, that doesn't help for people who call in and are only on audio. Right. right. Yeah. Um, Thank so you. That's All right, I'll move, move to adjourn. Second. Second by Yuri. Any other items of interest to the board members before we adjourn? Um, I just have just an update. There is a meeting on June 25th. I won't be um, staffing it, but Wayne will. So um, you have one permit hearing for that night. So we'll be sending that out next week. Okie doke. Can I ask about the schedule for the rest of the summer? I know that in past years, we've sometimes gone down to one meeting a month. Uh, do you have a sense of what we're gonna do this year? And if so, when those meetings will be happening? <sighs> um, well, it's definitely up to you. I haven't because of all of this um, new era, I didn't put the question out there to anybody about whether there were gonna be vacation days or <laughs> anyone wasn't gonna be around. Um, so I leave it up to you. I mean, we have a few permits in the wings. One's June 25th. I don't know yet for July how many more permits there will be. We could probably consolidate down to one meeting per month. If you would like to do that, that's not a problem. Sure. Um, we had also, Carolyn mentioned in her email to us earlier this week that we had, uh, we were going to schedule some other discussions with city boards, um, like we did tonight with the DPW. We were thinking of perhaps having a presentation by the housing, the housing partnership and also the Conservation Commission. Um, I, I found tonight's session useful. Um, I would hope that we could arrange these other conversations too during the summer when it's not too busy. Personally, I, I thought that the presentation today, I learned from that. Um, 
I want to rethink the infield and the whole issue of uh, infrastructure. And um, I like it. I like it. Yeah, my and view would be, I'm not sure that the meeting with the other boards would be as useful as it was tonight. I mean, obviously every project we vote on gets input from the three people we just heard from, but that's not true of um, Conservation Commission necessarily. They make their own decision, don't make input to us. And the housing partnership um, is barely involved. So I would question whether it would be as useful as it was tonight. Well, Alan, I, I guess I would push back a little bit and say, certainly from a housing point of view, it's, it's good for me to have a perspective from some professionals in that field about what the housing situation is like in Northampton, what our stock is like, what our trends are doing. So when we look at permits, that often those issues do come up. We're told that we need more housing for young professionals on Dewey Court, or we need this or we need that. And for me, I think hearing from the people who are in that game is very, very helpful. Um, rather than my trying to do that review. You're right, they don't provide direct input to any reports for us. Um, once in a while they come to our planning board meetings to speak in favor or against something, but um, I, I don't know, I think in both areas, Conservation Commission and um, Housing, they have this expertise that gives us a broader picture of what's going on in Northampton, which helps me when I look at decisions. I'm sorry, but Marissa. does the housing authority deal with general housing? And I mean, my I thought I thought they they dealt with uh, housing uh, partnership, not housing authority. <clears throat> right. Ah, uh, okay. Right, you're right about the housing authority, Marissa. They just deal with their own kind of projects on their own okay. residential units. Yeah. Hopefully they too understand a little bit more of this situation, but. I mean, we had the housing partnership or representatives from the housing partnership come to the Community Preservation Commission uh, committee at one point to, to, to talk, you know, I, after that experience, I don't feel like it's all that useful. I don't think they do that level of big picture plan. I think what they do is uh, support every possible housing project that comes along because you know they're they're in some sense that lobby you know they're not a lobbying organization but they based are pro housing uh everywhere so i i don't i didn't get the sense that they have a huge amount of specific you know like the level you're talking about do we court needs more young professional housing or something like that um you know i i don't i don't see much of a value in that i mean they're nice people <laughs> Okay, all right. And is that people's feeling also about the Conservation Commission? You understand their role, you feel like they're a kind of a separate silo and um, it's not really necessary to hear from them? Yeah, I think no more than they would want to hear from us. I mean, they have their own jurisdiction and um, make decisions based on their own area and regulations. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm always looking for some synergy around some of the volunteer boards that do things. There is certainly overlap with those folks. Um, you know, with the Conservation Commission, we see that often in our plans. Um, but I understand I'm not going to seemingly push my agenda if folks don't feel like it's um, an appropriate use of their time. I personally would find it useful to meet with both. I think maybe a little bit more Conservation Commission than um, Housing Partnership because we know that sometimes we're hearing about projects that they're also going to be hearing directly about. We've talked at times about should we be seeing this first, should they be seeing this first, and so forth. So I think there is a little bit more kind of direct overlap um, with them but nonetheless I, I think there are you know I haven't been on another board where uh, housing partnership has come and, and presented um, so 
I, I'm not opposed to hearing from them. I'm not sure the conversation would be quite as substantive or as long as tonight's was, and but that's okay with me. Um, I still think there would be some some value in it, and I appreciate you taking the initiative and setting these things up, George. Really sorry. So with what you're saying, I, I agree with the sentiment of what you're saying of of understanding where the sort of gaps between the seams or uh, wrong metaphor, I don't know, uh, between all these committees are. Um, uh, with that in mind, in, in a sense, it's, I think having ZBA, a conversation with ZBA where we have like a lot of overlap um, or is very close. Um, I mean, Carolyn is basically, is that communication, but uh, I mean, it would be maybe, I don't know what the format of something like that would be, to be honest, but I don't know, Carolyn probably could could articulate it better than, I well, I mean, actually, just tonight, the Z zoning board had a permit review for additional signs um, at the Starbucks um, on King Street. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about um, whether or not it was appropriate to have additional signage on the King Street side. Um, if you all may remember, this was the Colvest project. Um, across from Barrett Street. So it includes, not it's not just Starbucks, but it's a multi-tenant um, site that's being built. And um, the applicant made, the, um, made a comment saying that it didn't make sense that the planning board went ahead and approved this drive-through. How could the drive-through exist without these extra signs? So why did the planning board approve it? <laughs> um, because the zoning board has a very different jurisdiction and they just look at signs. So it was kind of, um, I mean, some, in some instances, there's can be a lot of overlap, and in other instances, it's it's less um, clear. But um, it's um, kind of ironic that that just came up tonight, um, and it sort of opens the whole question about why is planning board reviewing a whole all those details about the site, and then the signs are completely in a silo, separate, and go to the zoning board. Yeah. So did they get approved? They did, but it took a long discussion. And I showed the, I, you know, it, they ended up looking at the landscape plan to see, to make sure that there was sort of screening of those new signs that were gonna be installed. And so that was very helpful for them to see that whole site um, design that included lighting and landscaping and access and pedestrian access, which came up in their conversation. And were the signs like the menu boards basically? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. Did, did mouse droppings in the windows come up at all? <laughs> you know, I didn't hear that, but I can go back and check the recording. <laughs> well, that's because we, that's because we dealt with it. And so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so um, but I can, you know, whatever you guys want to do, I can reach out and have, <laughs> if you want to have another board at one of the other meetings, I think we could still, you know, it might be simpler to have it at a meeting where you don't have permits, so you're just focusing on permits. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we need an extra meeting in the summer. So you guys can still um, decide to meet only once in July and August. And if you want to tell me the dates now, that's fine. Or I can send out an email and a poll basically and say, you know, which dates are there most people going to be available? I, would it make sense to maybe I mean, there's a million issues where zoning and planning intersect uh -huh. um, in certain ways, but maybe, I mean, I'm thinking of the two-family form-based code. It seemed to be the expertise, I mean, what you really want to know when you look at a, plan, what a code like that is like, where does it not work? And the zoning, ZBA are the people who know when it's not working, right? Because they know what's being asked, like when will people want to bend the rules? Yeah. Um, so maybe keeping it more like focused on an uh, issue, like, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there, but um, as a possibility, um, that might make it a more fruitful conversation if we were gonna meet with them specifically, I don't know. Yeah, or maybe in the context of when we bring the form-based code, or, I mean, there are a couple of those codes that we're gonna bring forward for the planning board to discuss, also invite the zoning board in at the same time. A joint session, so you guys, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, so do you want me to send out an email to see what you guys prefer to for single meetings in July and August? Yeah, that's more efficient than doing okay. it here. Okay. Okie doke. Thank you, Carolyn.
Uh -huh. um, so there's been a motion made and seconded to adjourn our planning board meeting. <laughs> Any more discussion? So again, I'm sorry, Alan, but we need to go do the drill. We'll do it as quickly as possible. Everybody unmuted. Just like uh, a mask. Everybody Alan, if your if your camera just cuts out and then it's just over, you know. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Will, Will <laughs> is... <laughs> you can't end it without him. <laughs> what if we don't have a quorum? <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. All Stay right, Alan. Next meeting. Alan is a yes. We have one yes, Jana. Yes. Yes, Krista. Yes. Yuri. Yes. Marissa. Yes. David. Yes. Alan. And we already did, Alan. Yeah, Sam. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I voted Sam. twice. He's voted twice. It's and voter fraud. Why well, he has to vote twice? I actually, I actually abstain. I, I, I abstain. don't know. My child is out of control. All right. All right. All right. All right. Good night, y'all.